Welcome to my world Won't you come on in Today I have a very special guest. He has been singing with some of the biggest stars in the world and also the biggest star in the world. He was singing bass in a quartet called J.D. Sumner and the Stamps. His name is Larry Strickland. Uh, welcome, Larry. Hi, Stig. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And thank you very much for being with me here online uh, from Nashville. I guess it's Nashville you live in? Yeah, just, just outside of Nashville. We, we live out on a farm about, about 20 minutes outside of the city of Nashville itself. Um, you like uh, living in Nashville, I guess. You've been living there for many years. Yeah, I, I moved here in, in 1974 um, and just love it. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good sized city now. It's really grown in the last uh, three or four years. Um, but it's just a great place to live. You know, music everywhere. It's, that's why it's called Music City. You know, there's clubs, you know, there's hundreds of clubs that have live music every, every night of the week or did, you know, before the COVID thing. Um, just a fun place to live. And when we talk about music, you actually just put out a new album, Legacy. I, yep. I, I can understand it's the first album you have uh, ever done as a solo artist. How come it has taken so many years? <laughs> You know, I, when I was a young kid, I got in, interested in, in gospel quartets, and I just always sang with a with a group. You know, I was a bass singer. I never saw myself as, you know, being the front singer uh, or the solo singer. I, I just was more comfortable singing the bass part. You know, singing harmony and uh, being surrounded by a group. And uh, of course, a lot of the, the Things changed, and I had some folks ask me uh, several years ago why I didn't make a record, <laughs> and and I've also had them say, why don't, uh, why haven't you written a book or something? And I, of course, I never wanted to be the guy, you know, that wrote wrote another Elvis book, um, and so I decided, well, I'm gonna, you know, I, I, I can sing, so I'm gonna sing. That's my thing, and I, I went in the studio and. And made the record, so uh, now now I'm I'm pretty comfortable with, with singing uh, singing solo, you know, being the front guy. So it kind of changed changed my attitude. It has probably also been uh, very special for you for once in a while. Just have to look at the songs you wanted to record. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know the. the it was uh, just some some old gospel songs that I grew up with. Most of them were a couple couple were newer songs, um, and uh, I heard there's a there's an artist called Randy Chavez, a, a country artist that I really love his voice and and uh, his uh, his interpretation of, of music. And he he did a gospel record several years ago, and I happened to come across that and. And uh, just it, it inspired me to to go record my own. But is it an album you'll bring with you on tour? Are you going touring again, or are you staying at home and just making records? Well, you know, I hope to I hope that when things open back up, you know, and people start booking artists again, I'm, I, I hope to do some things, you know, here and there. Uh, there was some some of the fan clubs in uh, England had had asked me to to come over and I was supposed to go last year and of course it all got shut down. So I'm hoping that that, that will come back around. They'll ask me to come and, um, and of course I'll come and sing and, and meet with the fans. So uh, that, that's, yeah, I'm gonna get back out there. But uh, let's go a little bit back uh, into your childhood because uh, you didn't grow up in Nashville. You grew up in North Carolina. Um, how was your childhood? Um, you know, my, my family was very religious and my dad was, uh, was a pastor, a, a preacher, a pastor, whatever you call it there. And so <clears throat> spent a lot of time, you know, in church when I, when seems like when I wasn't in church, we were, we were having church, you know, in our house. Um, and my dad was actually the one that got me 
into the gospel music thing. He, when I was about 10 years old, he took me to my first gospel concert. And man, when I heard, you know, the very first time that I heard those guys singing and heard that sound coming off stage like that, it just really just went all through me. And I, I knew uh, from that time on, you know, that that was something I, that I wanted to do. I had no idea how or where I would end up, of course, but uh, I immediately started following a lot of the groups that were traveling around the country at that time and buying their records and um, I'd listen to them every day and I'd learn, I'd learn the music and I'd learn to sing the bass part. And um, so that's how it all started. Yeah. But what about your childhood where you had to, you have uh, your four kids in the family? You were, you were. Yeah. There was, uh, there was uh, I got two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother and then an older sister. Um, and they don't, They don't sing, you know. They, in fact, I don't remember them ever going to a concert, you know, back when we when we were kids. It was just me and my dad, so I don't really know how or why that happened that way. But uh, I was the only one that, that that got the bug. Yeah, and you didn't uh, do any sports back then when you were a kid. It was all music. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. How were you as a kid? Were you a child who loved going to school and loved reading, or what was your life like? You know, um, I was fairly average, and fairly fairly normal. Um, I tried sports, but I wasn't I wasn't any good playing sports. And even during the, during the time of when I was especially in high school, but I was so eat up with the with the music thing that that was that was really my focus. Uh, even as a teenager, you know, I was singing with quartets and, and traveling on the weekends and um, doing concerts and you know got started real early. So that was that was kind of my the only thing I thought about and the, and the only worthwhile thing, <laughs> the only worthwhile thing I ever did. <clears throat> And the, and those uh, you were singing with was that some friends of yours or was it professional groups you came into or, or how did it get started? Um, you know, people we we just met. I, I'm not even I can't even remember the first how we met from the the first group. Um, but people you know that I, I ran into that were already singing on some level, um, and they would ask me to come. You know, they, they heard about me in, in that area, I guess, and sought me out to come and sing with them. Um, that happened a couple of times. And one of the groups um, was a group in, in a little town called Fedville, North Carolina, which is uh, about an hour outside of Raleigh. Um, this guy was a pastor, and him and his family sang. And... I had known known my family and his family would known each other for quite a while and got a call from him one day to come and go with his family to sing. And so uh, I was with that group that were called the Centurions. Uh, there's a couple of records out there somewhere. Um, and we were, it was actually when I was singing with that group, the Centurions, we were doing a concert and the stamps J.D. Sumner and the Stamps were part of the concert, and they heard me sing with this group, and Ed Enoch, who was the lead singer for the Stamps, after the concert, came to, came up to me and um, asked for my my phone number, and he, he said, you know, I said, we, uh, you never know when we need, when we're going to need a bass singer, so... You know, I'd call you and give you a chance to audition if we ever need one. And this was when uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Richard Stur Richard Sturban, who was with the Oak Ridge Boys now, Richard was singing bass with with JD and the Stamps. And so I, you know, he's a he's a great singer, and I, I assumed that he would never he would never leave the Stamps uh, and Elvis. But it was about five years later 
Mm. And what year are we in? Are we in? Then we're in 69 when you play together with the, the Stames here at this program. Is that true? 69, 70, is that around there you, you played yeah. with them? And it then about, it went back. Yeah, it was like, like the late 69. Um, and so, you know, then it was five years later that I get the call to come to Nashville and, and audition. And um, I, got the, I got the job. And How many were at that audition? Sorry to interrupt, but how many, you say it was an audition, did they have more people coming there to, to get the job? You know, I, I don't know. It was just, I was the only one there um, at the time. So I, I don't know if they had tried other people or not. They pretty much saw the gospel world, gospel singing, gospel quartets, and the gospel music world is relatively small. And so they would have, the stamps, you know, being one of the top groups, they would have known who all was out there, you know, and who was available. And uh, so uh, I can't imagine that they auditioned to many guys, you know, they gave me a shot and um, they were probably probably people standing in line, you know, wanting the job. I was, yeah. fortunate enough to, I was fortunate enough to get it. And they were probably one of the most public gospel quartets at that time also, right? The oh, yeah. 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 But, but going a little bit back, uh, the interest for seeing bass, where did that come from? Uh, why was it bass you were going to become? Did you have a deep voice as a young teenager? Well, um, I, yeah, I did whenever my voice changed. Uh, it, it went to the to the lower side, but the first time I went to the, to hear the gospels group sing, it was the bass vocal that really captured my attention. You know that low rumbling sound. You'd, you'd feel the vibration in your in your seat. You know in the auditorium, and uh, it just you know that captured me. It just it, it uh, gave me the the desire to want to to want to be that. Sometimes I, I wish I had have gone the other direction and been more of a been more of a lead singer. You know, when you when you have a voice like this and and train it to be low, there's not there's not a lot that you can do other than sing low. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so, what the practice uh, learning to be the perfect best bass uh, singer? Uh, how did you do that? Did you go to a singing teacher or did you just train at home or? You know, I, uh, as I said earlier, I, I bought a, a lot of gospel albums. And literally, I, I'm not exaggerating on this, I would play those albums every day after school. When I got, when I'd come home, the first thing I'd do would go in my room, close the door and put those albums on. And I would stand there and sing with those records, you know, for two, for two or three hours, probably. I, I really don't remember how long, but I would... Uh, until everybody got home, you know, the mom and dad worked, there was no, no one home. Um, and so I had the house to myself and I, I would just sing over and over and over until I, you know, until I trained my voice and I, I learned to hear the, the bass part and learn to blend. And uh, so I'm, I'm self-taught, but I was so, I was so smitten by it and so eat up with it, you know, I, I just continually, um, um, I, I guess I could say I, I was obsessed with it. Yeah. <laughs> and what about your father? Because he shared this interest. Did he ask you to come to church and sing also, or or, or how did the uh, how did that go? Did he ask about kind of things? Well, not until not until much later. You know, I was after it was years later before I ever really um, went to his church to, to sing. In fact, it was with, it was with the group that I. I was talking about earlier with the group of the Centurions that were from Fedville, North Carolina. With that, that group, I think we sang at my dad's church uh, a couple of times. So those, that was the first time. But I was, I was just getting up and singing by myself in, in his church. No, I, I never did that. And he was proud, I can imagine. Uh, was it like your mother and father asked you to say, OK, it's fine, you, you like to sing, but you better get yourself a real job uh, also? <laughs> Yeah, especially my mom, you know, she, she, uh, she just couldn't see it. You know, she was like, son, you know, that, that singing is good. And, um, uh, I know you enjoy it, but you're going to really have to learn 
something, you know, to do for life. You got to learn a trade or, you know, learn a job and, and just, you know, let that be your hobby. So she was, she was never, even, even after I was with the stamps and with Elvis, you know, she was still kind of looked at it like I was, I didn't have a real job, but I was just kind of, uh, kind of a hobby. Amazing. But you actually uh, went out uh, and uh, start working with something uh, different than singing. You actually went into the army. Yeah. <clears throat> During the Vietnam thing, um, you know, we had the draft here, the draft, the military draft. And I had gotten a notice that I was going to be drafted. And instead, they, they gave me an option of Uh, they said, if you'll join the military instead of being drafted, we'll try to send you uh, someplace other than Vietnam. And that's, that sounded like a good deal to me because I would, did not want to go to Vietnam, obviously. <laughs> and so I joined, I joined the Army for four years, and uh, I wound up uh, in Germany for, for three of those years. So uh, I, was in, I was in Frankfurt, Germany. And I worked for the National Security Agency there. Did you like that? Living in Germany and working there in the army? Well, you know, I, I would have rather been home and singing and doing that kind of thing. But it was, uh, I did learn to to be settled with it and accept it and did my best to uh, to be happy and get through it. And actually, you are also very close to be uh, drafted for Vietnam. I have read somewhere or heard somewhere in an interview with you that you actually were very close to be taken out for going to Vietnam, but your dad did what he could just to help you out of that. Is that true? Yeah, that's the truth. Um, when I Even after I joined the, for the four years, you know, they and, and once they have you, they have you. Um, I was in basic training, and then they sent me to a, He sent me to another school that was the, every, everybody from that particular school. It was a, a teletype school, and a, a thing where you you know a communications deal. And I knew that everybody that was in that class was heading for for uh, Vietnam, <clears throat> and so I called my dad and told him what had happened. You know that I I wasn't getting what they had promised me, so my dad jumped in and called, uh, got a hold of our state representative um, and, and the government, and they got it changed for me. It's kind of a kind of a miracle, you know, because usually that, I mean, my dad was, he, he had no no influence of any kind. You know, he just picked up the phone and called and, and got it changed. It sounds like a very good dad you had. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was it was it uh, because he was a, a minister? Was it very religious at your home or? Oh yeah, very. You know, it was um, everything that we did pretty much was centered around the church and and the activities in the church. Um, of course, after after I got to be a teenager, my, my older brother and I we we got to hang out and do some normal teenager kind of kind of things on the weekends. But yeah, it was uh, our whole life pretty much was centered around going to church and all that kind of stuff. Well, back again from Germany, you began singing again and you ended up at this audition uh, uh, later on uh, with J.D. Sommer and the Stames. Um, do you remember uh, how, how, how did the accept you, uh, the other members of uh, the Stames, when you came there? What was your first impression of Ed, Enoch, and Ed Hill, and uh, J.D.? Um, you know, I, I, of course, I had seen them many times perform, and had only slightly met uh, Ed, Enoch. I'd never met J.D. or the other guys. But <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, they were all really really normal to me, very, very helpful and encouraging. And, um, you know, it didn't take very long at all to, to fit in and to, to feel accepted and, and, uh, 
you know, be part of the group. Because I immediately, whenever I came to Nashville, um, I mean, it was just a matter of days before we were on the bus, you know, heading to, to do a gospel tour. Uh, not with Elvis. When Elvis wasn't, wasn't touring, the Stamps would go out and tour on their own, you know, and do gospel shows. Um, and so we were, that was my, my first deal with the Stamps was a gospel tour. Um, and it was, you know, once I learned the material, it, it took a while to, to really learn their, learn their show and, um, and get comfortable with that. But, you know, once that, once that happened, I mean, it was, I was off and running. It was, a, it was just a great time. And it was, a, you know, to be, to be able to sing on that level with guys with that kind of talent, um, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was the weakest singer on stage, you know, is the way I look at it. And everybody surrounding me were, were, you know, just great, uh, great vocalists. And so they did, they just pulled me up, you know, and pulled me along. So that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Uh, did you had any thoughts about uh, going in to be a part of uh, the stage, even if they were a famous group and they played all over? But they also had this work with Elvis, who was maybe in the beginning of his career, at least, uh, not so popular in the church. Uh, later on, we, of course, found out he made these religious albums and had high thoughts about religion. But uh, did you have any doubts about that? Also going to Vegas, which was maybe the uh, Sin City. Did you have any, any thoughts about it to begin with? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I probably should have, but... Um... I was so excited about the whole life change and being, you know, being in that, in the, uh, being a professional singer and touring and the whole other thing. I was, I was, I was too excited to um, even make that connection. You know, it was just, uh, I was loving the music and um, it was, a, it was a great thing. So then, no, there was no, I, I didn't have any, any thoughts or any hesitation about about doing that at all. I mean, Elvis was, uh, you know, he was the biggest artist in the, in the world. He was, there was no, there was no show uh, any bigger than his. And, uh, you know, that was, that was the pinnacle. That was, that was the very top. So, you know, to have any reservations about being a part of that, you know, is, um, doesn't compute. And your father was not a little bit afraid of his son going to Vegas and to perform with all this and all those things that could happen. Uh, you know, I mean, I was a I was a, an adult on my own, and I I really didn't really didn't consult them. You know, I told them what I was going on, and uh, of course they knew there was nothing they could say to to stop me. So there was you know there was not much conversation about uh, about it from them. Yeah. But now we are there talking about Elvis. Uh, can you tell uh, us a little bit about the first meeting you had with Elvis? Where was that and uh, how was that? Yeah, um, Las Vegas was was my first my first meeting and my first shows with, with Elvis was at the International Hilton in, uh, in Las Vegas. And my very first meeting with him was they scheduled a, a rehearsal the night before he was to open uh, there and up up uh, top of the Hilton Hotel there was a big uh, ballroom and they were in the ballroom to uh, all the band was there and all all the singers backups and the sweet inspirations and uh, all the stamps and and then the band members they were all there to rehearse but I, I made a big mistake my very first meeting, and, and I wasn't aware of it uh, at first. But at, at that particular time, um, bib overalls was a popular dress, uh, you know, for younger younger people. I mean, obviously older people, but uh, older people didn't see it. But younger girls and guys are wearing bib overalls. It was it was hip. If you, if you know what that word is. Yeah, I do. And so um, I I bought I had I had a pair of bib overalls because I thought they were I thought I was being hip I thought I was being cool, 
And so I had those those bib overalls on when I went up to the rehearsal. And when Elvis came in, um, of course, I was extremely intimidated just by the sight of him, you know, coming through the door with the bodyguards on each side and uh, moving around the room. Uh, he was going over to the suites and hugging them. And then he came over to the stamps and talking to JD and slapping him on the back and laughing and carrying on. And, and I'm kind of standing over to the side trying to trying to uh, not call any attention to myself really because I was I was too intimidated but finally um, Ed Enoch said to Elvis he called him E said E I want you to meet uh, our new bass singer Larry Strickland and Elvis looked at me and he put his hand out and shook my hand and then he pulled Ed over to the side and he said Ed where in the world did you get the effing farmer and I heard him say it because he was just well, just a couple of feet away from me. And when I heard that, you know, I, I, I immediately went into almost a panic attack. And, Whoa, man, I have really called the wrong kind of attention to myself with these bib overalls. And he went around and then Elvis went around the room talking with everybody else. But he would point, he would point me out and uh, just everybody just had a the whole entourage had a big laugh over me and my overalls. <laughs> it's not nice of Elvis doing that. <laughs> I guess you might have felt very bad at that time. Well, it's, it's funny now, but it, it wasn't funny then because I thought I would probably would be fired. You know, I thought, you know, I've, I've made the wrong impression. Uh, I'm not fitting in here at all, and I'm probably going to be on the next plane home, you know, from from Vegas. Um, <clears throat> but what what they didn't tell me, uh, and of course they didn't think to tell me because they, you know, it's, it's not like it's written down anywhere, but Elvis really, he really didn't like those, uh, those overalls. If you've ever seen any of the pictures of him as a small child when he's like two or three years old, yeah. he's, he's wearing those, he's wearing those little bib overalls. And so, you know, to him that those those represent you know poverty and a and a rough time in his life. So uh, he didn't he didn't like any kind of blue jeans or jeans of any kind uh, to be worn on sh on stage. He didn't allow all that. Uh, and uh, and so I guess when he's when he saw me wearing those bib overalls, it was uh, he probably didn't know what else to do but just make fun of it. At my expense. Uh -huh. That must have been terrible for you. I I can imagine, you know. Oh, it and, was. Yeah. It and, was. But, uh, but then he dressed you up for stage. Was that Elvis uh, deciding that you needed to be dressed up also uh, the stamps and the sweet inspirations and the band members? Or, or who was that uh, taking care of that? That, okay, this new guy, he also needs to have a, a suit like us when we're going on stage uh, singing with Elvis. Because I don't think they were wearing the same suit when the stamps played in churches and things, right? No. Uh, um, JD, pretty much JD and Ed Enoch, uh, Ed was kind of the manager of the group, worked, worked with Ed. Um, JD was, of course, JD was the owner of the group, but Ed was kind of manage is what I'm trying to say. And and so they they procured the same kind of clothes that you know we all dressed alike. And so they bought some, some beautiful suits, you know, for me to wear. We had we had a red suit and a black and a, and a white suit, and and then several other more casual things. And uh, we all dressed we all dressed alike on stage, so that that was never a problem. And, and uh, just a question back to this first time you met Elvis because it was a rehearsal. How long time did you rehearse uh, at that time? Was it just an hour and then he was gone again? Or how long time did you rehearse with Elvis? Uh, <clears throat> you, know, um, you know, it probably lasted a couple of hours. Um, it's all kind of a blur. There was there was a there was two or three songs that they were that he was wanting to add to the show, and I don't remember which ones they were. I wish I did. Wish I could remember, um, but it was uh, but it was helpful for me as well to to have my first start there rather than 
you know, uh, starting out immediately on stage, which was hard enough as it was, you know, to be there. And, and, and with the stamps, they didn't do a lot of rehearsing either. You know, they had, they had worked with Elvis so much, you know, it was just all, um, automatic with them, you know, the, the backup parts. And so they, they taught me the parts, the backup parts, you know, as the show was going on, they had hand signals for me. Uh, they would show there would be a hand signal for me to do an ooh, you know, Ed Enoch standing next to me, he would kind of put his hand out and, and, and do it like that for an ooh. And then if, if the next, if the next thing to sing was an ah, he'd open up an ah, that's an ah, you know, open hand. And, and then uh, uh, if they wanted to, if we were to sing the lyrics along with Elvis, they would, they would do this, that meant to, to sing along. <laughs> so, so the first, uh, you know, the first week I'm, I'm sitting, I'm standing there, I'm learning all these parts uh, uh, by hand signal. Um, so, <clears throat> It, it it wasn't all that hard, you know. I mean, you're, you're singing oohs and ahs primarily, and uh, and a lot of the songs, I, of course, I was already familiar with, so uh, it wasn't much of a stretch, you know, for me to to learn the parts. I guess you didn't rehearse a lot with Elvis. Uh, how many times did you have these rehearsals uh, every year, or? <clears throat> No, that the that one rehearsal. That's that's the only time we rehearsed. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we never had another another rehearsal from that point. Uh, of course, when we recorded, you know, we did the. Uh, I was part of the recordings at, at uh, in the Jungle Room at Graceland, and those were you know, we would rehearse those songs just just before the uh, before we would record. Yeah. But that was you know that was not really the same as rehearsing for a show. Okay, but but uh, just staying a little bit here the first time, uh, how did you get along with all these uh, other members? Because it was a big entourage, you know, there were all the musicians, the Sweet Inspirations, there were TCB band and Joe Gershow and his orchestra and so on. It was a big entourage plus his bodyguards and Charlie Hodge and, and all those guys. Was it difficult to come as a new member into this big entourage? Um, yes. Yes and no. Um, you know the the backup singers, us and the Sweet Inspirations, and Cheryl Nielsen <clears throat> and Kathy Westmoreland. We were all kind of a, a a group. You know, we we worked together very closely because we were singing together and together on stage. Um, some of the band members, <clears throat> um, you know, I would get to I would get to hang out with you know, once in a while on the, on the plane or when we were traveling or whenever it, it was, um, uh, everybody was really, really kind. You know, there was, there was no one in the, in the band that, um, you know, was difficult or <clears throat> snooty or standoff. And, you know, they, they accepted me and, and treated me just as kind and as, as normal as you know one would would uh, expect um, and really I really got to to know them and, and really love them James Burton he uh, very close with him in fact he lives not too far from me now uh, Ronnie Tut uh, uh, I was friends with him he's really a great guy and John Wilkerson all those guys you know just uh, really, really good people. Um, you know, they didn't try to make it hard for me. The, the people that I <clears throat> that I really didn't have any kind of relationship with at all was um, the bodyguards. Even when they even when they were away from Elvis, you know, they didn't really hang out with us, uh, you know, with the, with the band members and the singers. <clears throat> and I remember I, I I approached one of them. I won't say which one, but just I was uh, we were all hanging out in a in a in a restaurant in a hotel where we were all staying on we were on tour. And I just, of course, not knowing any better, I walked over to the table where there's like three of them, three of the bodyguards are sitting together, 
And uh, <clears throat> I kind of leaned in, you know, and I put my hand on the back of the chair uh, behind one of them, and it kind of he kind of brushed his shoulder, and he immediately turned and looked at me and said, and said, uh, "Hey, man, don't, don't touch me." You know, one of those kind of things. And so I, I immediately stood up and I went, "Whoa!" And I, I turned and I, and I walked away. You know, and so, um, you know, they had they had their own little club. You know, and then and, and you, if you weren't a, if you weren't weren't part of a bodyguard, you know that. Or what what they call the the Memphis Mafia, you know, if you weren't part of that, you didn't uh, you didn't mix with them. Okay, so they stayed for themselves, and it was must also seem a little bit strange that Elvis uh, on this rehearsal day uh, was surrounded by his bodyguards, you know, because he was among friends, you know, his band members. Yeah, no, he he, the only time I was with Elvis when the when the bodyguard bodyguards weren't around was um in the house at Graceland when we were recording they were not part of that and I don't remember any of any of them being in the room at all um and they could have been in other parts of the house or uh, I'm not sure I just but when, I never saw them during those recording sessions I can imagine the first impression of Elvis cannot have been that good when he made all this fun with you on the first time you met him. Did you uh, had a not so good uh, impression of him that day? Because he made fun with you. Well, I mean, I I got over that pretty quick because you know the next night when I'm on stage, I didn't I didn't get fired, I didn't lose my job. Um, And the next night after that incident at rehearsal, you know, I'm, I'm on stage and I'm in, a, in the music and everything. Um, and so, you know, that that was the wonderful part of being uh, being with Elvis was on stage. Um, and, you know, the huge orchestra and, and all the all the singers and the, the sound and the lights and then Elvis with his, in his outfits and you know, just looking beautiful and singing and so it was so great. And, uh, you know, you get caught up in that. I mean, that's, there's, there's not much better, uh, not a, not a much higher high could you be on, you know, and, and, and than the joy of being in the middle of that. So, um, it, it didn't take long, long to, for me to forget about the, the overall incident. Yeah. And, uh, and if you, Today or back then, looked at Elvis. What kind of man was he? You know, whenever I was around, except for that one time, whenever you know, we we, we were either touring or recording, and <clears throat> that was when he was at his best. You know, mentally and uh, vocally, uh, and most of the time physically. You know, he was uh, when he was making music. You know, he was doing what he was meant to do and what he loved, and he was just always so really uh, kind and <clears throat> and smiling, joking around, laughing, a lot of laughing. Um, and it, it was just, um, it was enjoyment. And back in Las Vegas, where you had your first performance with him, it must also have been something very special except being on stage with him but i can, can imagine there was a little bit more audience and they were maybe a little bit louder than they normally were in the church where you, when you played with the stains <laughs> yeah just a little bit that was a, that was another thing you know was we uh we were doing a show on stage but the, the audience was doing a show for us because we you know we got to see some pretty funny pretty funny things going on you know with the With the girls rushing the stage and really trying to get get uh, to where they could touch him somehow, you know, or get get his attention, and so um, that was pretty intense. It, it could be kind of scary at sometimes because you'd see this rush, this wall of people, you know, would come rushing toward toward the stage, you know, and you would it it could be a a little disconcerting, you know, I was afraid somebody was going to get hurt or You know, if we made it on the stage, they were gonna rip us apart, you know, or something. Um, but it was a, uh, it was just part of it, you know. And it, uh, 
that's one of the great things about an Elvis show, you know, was a, was a screaming audience. <clears throat> Yeah, and that was uh, whatever it was in Ohio or it was in Phoenix or it was in Vegas. People are always screaming. Or was there any difference from the concerts in Vegas and when you went on tour and the audience? Yeah, no, there was no difference. Didn't matter. Didn't matter where you were, what or what the venue was. It was the audience reacted the same. Was it hard for you just uh, staying in Vegas for such a long time? Uh, I guess there cannot be that much things to do in Vegas, you know, uh, during daytime. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it wasn't for me because I, you know, until I, by that first time with Elvis, I'd, I'd never been to Vegas. So I was just captured by, you know, the lights and the sounds and the smells. And, and uh, of course, there was a big, nice swimming pool at, at the Hilton that we'd all hang out in the daytime. And, <clears throat> Uh, good food, and so uh, I loved it. In fact, I, I still love Vegas. I don't get to go that often, but um, you know, I have good memories from there, and it's 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 fun. And I like to play the I like to play the games. I, I'm not a big gambler, but it's fun to play blackjack and those kind of things once in a while. Um, so I I didn't get bored at all. <clears throat> And did you get any time uh, all those years where you were in Vegas with Elvis? Did you get time after the show, spending time with Elvis in his suite uh, upstairs? Or was it more like uh, when the show was over, you went for yourself and Elvis went for himself? Uh, you know, there was just a couple of times when, when we when we got to do that and got to see him after the show. And I, before I joined the Stamps, um, they were they were doing it a lot. They would, uh, especially in, in Vegas, he would have everybody, especially the singers and, and the stamps, especially. He would have them come to his suite, <clears throat> and they would they would stand around a piano and sing till four o'clock in the morning, singing old gospel songs and that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I would love to have been a part of that, but you know, part of me says, you know, man, I'm, I'm kind of glad he wasn't doing it. You know, whenever I was whenever I was there, because I I don't know if I could have held up to four o'clock in the morning standing around singing, I would have been, um, you know, that would be pretty tiresome. Did you sing for Elvis? Because I know he liked having the same singing when he had guests like Tom Jones or others. Did you go sing for him like that also or in the time you were in Stames or was that over at that time? The, yeah, he had, he wasn't doing that. I didn't get to do any of that. Um, uh, there were some occasions before I joined the Stamps where <clears throat> There was uh, something going on out in, uh, I think it was Colorado, and uh, Elvis was out there, and he actually sent his plane back to Nashville to pick the stamps up and and flew them out to participate in uh, in whatever was was going on in Colorado. And uh, there was a, a couple other times when he had them come in come in to sing, you know, just just a quartet, but that was before my time. So there's not much uh, social uh, going on together with Elvis between him and the band members uh, in the later years. No, just whenever we were just whenever we were doing music. Yeah, and I guess on the tour you didn't see him uh, much because he was flying in his own flight to the new town, and the band members was uh, in another flight maybe uh, going to the town, and then you saw him on stage. Yes, yeah, we we but flew in separate. We few flew in separate planes, and and whenever it was possible, he would he would actually fly back to Memphis, you know, after the show. But uh, there was other places where it didn't make sense, and he would be in he would be in the same hotel with us. Uh, but obviously, he, he wasn't roaming around the hotel. So I didn't I, I wouldn't see him, you know, until until he came on the stage. But you had a good chance uh, to spend time with him when you were doing the recordings in the Graceland. Can you tell us a little bit about those recordings? Yeah, those. Uh, that's when I really got to be the be the closest with him. You know, in a more intimate setting in the in the jungle room in, in Graceland. Um, RCA was really after him to record a record, and he he 
uh, agreed to record if they would come and do bring a, a mobile unit and so he could stay at home and record. <clears throat> and so they used the jungle room. They set it up as best they could to like a recording studio. And, and uh, Elvis would come downstairs and we'd all be down in, in, uh, in the room and he would joke around and, uh, and would talk, you know, and it was, it was all small talk, not anything, anything serious. Um, and then we'd, we would get right into the music, uh, rehearsing it, and he would come and stand, stand with us, you know, with the quartet and the suites, and we'd work out our, our harmony parts and our, our oohs and ahs and the background parts. And he would, he had a hand in that, you know, uh, figuring out what, what he wanted. And other times he would just let us, let us do what we, what we wanted, you know, whatever we heard. And he would either like it or not like it, and uh, a lot of give and take, you know, back and forth on on creating the sounds. Uh, but there was one night in particular when we were we were all in the in the room. We thought he was coming down, and uh, Charlie Hodge came down. And he said, uh, "Elvis is not coming down right now." He said he's up in his closet. He's uh, he wants to redo his whole wardrobe so he's getting rid of everything everything he's going to get a whole new wardrobe and stay not just for stage but his casual casual clothes as well and uh so if there's any of that stuff uh you guys might want you know he i'll let you you know you guys go up one at a time and and uh see what uh see if there's anything that you want and, and I get I get the opportunity to go upstairs. It's just me. And I go up and um, I'm I'm in the closet. Just uh, I'm in his closet with him, and he's um, going through clothes. And he'd take those clothes out. He'd take a a shirt out or something and hold it up, you know, to me like he's wondering how I'm gonna <laughs> how I'm gonna look in that shirt. And of course, anything you handed to him, I'd go, oh yeah, I was I, I like that man. That's that's good. I, I I can wear that, you know, and of course, knowing all all along that I would never wear the stuff. You knew wore it. You no, awesome. no, <clears throat> no. I'm, I immediately when I got home with them, I I put them in storage. Okay, it, but it was just been very special, you know. You're there just to do a recording, and then Charlie comes down and say, "You guys, uh, Elvis don't have time." <laughs> he decided to. <laughs> He yeah. decided to clean up his closet, you know, for clothes. <laughs> and I can imagine it's expensive to have a lot of musicians and recording people, uh, technicians sitting there waiting for recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was oh, yeah. just a... yeah. I... it's, it's thousands, thousands of dollars being being uh, spent, you know, to have to have all of us not only just our expenses to be in town, but you know, the paying us for. Uh, you know, all that all that work is union work. You know, and there's there's a union skill that, that you have to pay each singer and each musician. You know, per per song, sometimes per song and sometimes per hour. But um, so yeah, it was it was a huge waste of money for uh, for RCA for sure. <laughs> Did you get a lot of uh, clothes from him? You know, I, I got a couple of shirts and I and then I got a um, a couple of um leisure suit looking looking things you know not your normal leisure suit but it was a uh, you know something obviously it's different that elvis you know obviously where elvis didn't wear normal normal clothes a lot of stuff the shirts he, he gave me were were custom made uh just for him you know it had the big the big collar and the elastic uh you know, around the arms on both, both well, I, I guess the elastic was here, uh, and the big collar. Um, and so I, I kept them for years, but um, a few years ago, I, uh, I sold them. I got, I got offered a lot of money for them, and so uh, I did, I did sell them. It's always good to say yes when the when the deal is good. Do you have anything left from uh, the time you were performing with Elvis? Did you did he give you something that you still keep as a well, memory? The uh, the TCB, um, you know the TCB necklace. Yes. 
Um, that's that's uh, that's the only thing that I have uh, left from those days. That and my memories. Yeah. And do you still use the necklace? I, I wear it, you know, if I, if I go to Graceland, you know, we normally go to Graceland every year to do a gospel thing, and, or have been. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing this year. Well, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing stuff there or stuff with a fan club, uh, I'll, I'll wear it, you know, if I'm on stage uh, singing or, or whatever, I'll, I'll wear it for those kind of occasions. Yeah. Back to the jungle room and the and the sessions. You were there five or six days. So how many days did you spend there? And it must have been pretty crowded and in that room with so many musicians. It was very crowded. You know, in a normal in a normal recording studio too, you you have uh, different rooms. You know, for different instruments and for for the vocalist, the vocal booth is is a separate room, and then you the drums are usually in a in a closed in area or, or or room to itself and then your uh, your guitar amps uh will be in special places you know with big big baffling uh, baff, uh sound baffles you know in front of the uh guitar amps so that all the inst instruments don't bleed into each other you know in the mic because when they record, you want to you want to have as much separation between it, each instrument and each voice that, that you can possibly have, so that when you go to mix, you have more control over each part, you know, and you can and you can really make a, a beautiful record that way. Um, but in the jungle room, you know, just everything was all crammed in there. There was a couple of small uh, separators between a couple of the, the guitar amps and um i think there was a, a little sound thing around just around the front of the drums um but everything else is just open in the room and you know I'll, you go back and listen to those records and you you wonder how in the world did they turn out as well as they did because uh in that situation all the instruments would be bleeding into everybody else's mic you know the vocal mics would be picking up the drums or the guitars and um and vice versa you know that you would just think it would just be a roaring sound wall of sound but you, those records turned out great man they just um and i'll never i'll never forget the, the first the first the first song i was part of and this is kind of unique too elvis came down on the on the my first night of, of recording and um uh hurt was the first song that the that he recorded that night Amazing. and um i'll never forget he only sang that song like twice uh normally in the studio you know you you sing the song over and over and um you know you could sing it 10 or 20 times you know before you you figure you've done your best or whatever and he he literally sang that song twice and they and one of those takes, you know, was was the record. Um, it just blew me away. And then and the rest of the songs, it wasn't like he struggled and, uh, you know, would have to stop and, you know, no, let's go back. And um, but he was well prepared with those songs. He came, he, he just sang through them, you know, top to bottom. And then, he'd, you know, if he did wasn't happy, he would go back and sing it again, you know, maybe two or three times or, or if that many, or he would do it for the backup singers. Of course, um, if we had made any mistakes or those kind of things, we could always go in the studio, you know, here in Nashville and, and redo anything that we needed to do, but we never, uh, we never got a call to do that. They, uh, they just took them in the studio here in Nashville and they, and they made great records out of, out of all the recordings. That's amazing. Uh, did he warm up? Normally, uh, a singer will warm up before he has to go and record a song. His voice, you know, did, do you have any, uh, do you remember if Elvis was warming up his voice before going uh, and singing? If, if he was, I didn't hear it, you know, and, and Graceland, if you've been in there, you know that house is not that big. If he had have been, we were, uh, we were standing, or our place of, where we were recording was kind of right at the bottom of the steps. Um, and if he had been warming up upstairs, we would have heard it. 
but he he didn't, you know, and that's that's the amazing thing about hurt because you know how that song starts. I'm so hurt. I mean, just you know, at full volume and full voice, and he just he just nailed it, you know, like he'd been singing on it all day. He could have been, but um, it, it really got my attention when he when he started out so so strong like that. How was Elvis? If you should describe him as a singer, how would you describe him as a singer? He was, a, he was a stylist. He was he could take any any song and, and just about any style of music and make an Elvis song out of it. You know, you no longer thought of it. Well, that's a that song is a remake of so and so, or you know, I remember uh, somebody else singing that song. You, you, whenever he took a song and recorded it or sang it on stage, it, it became an Elvis song. That's what I mean by a stylist. You know, you uh, people try to copy him, and some some do copy him pretty well, but um, there's nobody to like him. I never heard him sing off pitch. Um, he sang, and he sang hard. Uh, if you notice him on stage, you know, I mean, when when he's doing his moves and all that stuff, he's not only is he moving like that, but he's singing singing really hard, so that have that kind of control over your voice and, and your body and uh, you know it was amazing it's not everybody can do that you know these a lot of these singers these days you see them on TV and they have all these dance routines well very few and you they, they have a microphone and they look like they're singing but most of them are just lip singing they're singing to a track because they they can't do all those dance moves and do the proper breathing and be able to sing. They just can't do it. Uh, but, you know, Elvis, Elvis never did anything like that. He was full on and live. Um, and uh, his voice was, he, he had an amazing range with his highs and, and then his lows. And um, he was uh, he was phenomenal. I mean, I don't know what else to say. You know, I, I don't think there'll they'll ever be a, another one like him. I mean, there's some great singers out there, of course, but uh, the image that he had, his image, his look, I mean, my Lord, what else do you need? Yeah. Do you have a favorite song among the songs that you recorded with Elvis? And do you also have a favorite song among the songs you were singing with Elvis on, on stage? Well, um, one of the songs that was fun to record because me and JD had had bass parts on it was way down. If you remember that song. Yeah, I love it. Um, that's that's one of the one of the first ones we recorded uh, in the jungle room and and on that course uh, at the top of the course uh, that's me doing the first way down doing the doo -doo -doo -doo, way down um, and then the then then the very last one J J D does the way we on down. Um, so he and I are trading off, you know, to the, to the whole song with that. Uh, just we'll throw that out there, <laughs> get a little bit of credit, you know, where, where I can. Um, so that was, um, that was probably the most fun one. I, uh, and Moody Blue sticks in my mind too. You know, the song Moody Blue, of course the record was called Moody Blue too, but oh, Moody Blue. Tell me, am I getting new? I mean, it's just a great song, and he just I loved I loved hearing him sing it. Um, but on stage, probably uh, the most the, the biggest thing it felt like it was the biggest thing we did. You know, it was American Trilogy, and uh, of course we had you know the stamps. We had a uh, a special part in that song as well, where he, where he would. Let us shine a little bit, and it had such a, you know, it started off so so calm and soft, and it built into such a crescendo. I mean, it was just huge, and uh, so that's that was one of the songs that was the most fun to do. If you should look back at the times you had with Elvis, do you have a good funny anecdote from the time, some funny moment happening with Elvis? Uh, that you still smile when you think back at? 
Well, there was a, <laughs> you know, some of it, so much of it is kind of inside. I don't know if if if, if it would translate to to the, you know, to anybody listening to me tell it. But one one night, um, and it was on the song "Hurt." The the, the microphone that Elvis used it was a real thin deal, and it had a had the soft uh, wind uh, windscreen on top of it. That's made of made out of kind of a fabric kind of deal, um, and he's singing. Uh, he's going into to I'm hurt, you know, the opening line of the song. And when he when he sang uh, when he hit the word I'm so when he hit the word hurt I'm so hurt. Well, this thing came out of his throat. <laughs> um, you know, it's like a, I don't know what you, just this, this liquid, this, this, um, <clears throat> you know, when you get, when you're trying to clear your throat. Yeah. Uh, this, this glob, this glob of white stuff came out of his throat and landed on the, on the uh, windscreen of that, of the microphone. Yeah. But it was on, it was on the side facing him. So the audience couldn't see it. But all of us on stage could see it. Um, and of course, Elvis, he's in the middle of the song and he doesn't know it. He doesn't know that it's there. And the sweet inspiration, <laughs> he, he started walking over toward the sweets with the microphone and that glob of stuff on the, on the microphone. <laughs> and those girls started gagging <laughs> right, on, right on stage. They were turning. They had to turn away from him, and they were coughing and gagging. <laughs> so that was a that was a funny moment for for kind of an inside thing. Um, and then I don't know if you think that's funny or not, but it was just. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then then um, he uh, when we did the New Year's Eve concert. Um, at, at uh, Pontiac, Michigan, the Pontiac Stadium, uh, the Pontiac football. It was a football stadium, but it was in, inside. It was a covered covered dome. And they had a huge stage set up for us, 78,000 people in the stands for an Ellis concert. And he, uh, halfway into the show, he did a did one of his moves. And he's on the, the stage looks, is, is built like a, like a wedding cake. As it, had, it was three levels, and on the bottom level was all the orchestra, uh, you know, strings and everything. On the second level was was uh, James Burton and and the drums, and on one kind of one end, one side, and then the us backup singers were on the other side, and then and Elvis was on the very very top layer by himself, and uh, he he split split the bottom out of his pants. <laughs> On the, right, of course, he's so far away from the audience. You know, we were out in the middle of his football field, so it's not like people could really see it, but we could we could see it where we were. And he had he had to leave the stage, which took quite a while because he he was a long way away from uh, the dressing rooms. Um, so he had to leave the stage and go change his outfit to come back. Uh, so that was that was a memory. Because he had us when he, while he was gone, as he was leaving the stage, he said, I'm, I'm, "I want my stamps to sing a very beautiful a cappella song for you. It's the sweet, uh, sweet, sweet spirit, you know, which was a thing he would have us, he would have us do every night. But to, to do that a cappella song in that setting, you know, when in a building that huge and 68,000 screaming fans, and you figure that it's New Year's Eve and people are." are even more rowdy and we're going to sing this real touching spiritual uh gospel song acapella for him uh that was a memory because i was i was really afraid that people would boo us or something you know at the end of it because they were but they didn't you know they were just they were very respectful that's good and i guess you had to sing more songs than that if you had to go far away to change clothes and and it's actually good that he always wear had some extra clothes with him. Stay <laughs> close to. Yeah. If you look back at at Elvis as an entertainer and as a man, 
what was his strong sides uh, as a man and as an entertainer? And then again, what was the weak sides of him? Looking back. Um, well, his, his, his strong, strong side was obviously his, his voice. Um, and his and his style, you know, I mean, he it wasn't like he had um, somebody come to him and, and and like they do nowadays, you know, some, somebody gets a recording contract and the first thing they do is they, they hire uh, people to come to come and uh, try to figure out what their image will be, you know, to work work with them and you know how they, to to give them to give them an image. Well, Elvis, he already had the image. You know, he created that image just himself. You know, and, and so you look back at the the old the old pictures of him, you know, on stage and the way he's dressed and or anywhere. And even even though even when he's just out and about, uh, you know, in, in his what's what was to him his street clothes, it was still very very unique stuff you know that he was 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 wearing so he, he just had this uh he had this image you know that he created that just just didn't quit you know i mean it's you could you could see him coming from a mile away you know it was elvis um so those were a strong one and, and he was a, a extremely generous uh, man i mean just buy people cars uh, that was one of his favorite things. He would he would buy Cadillacs for just uh, you know he, there was a, a a black lady he ran into some somewhere I don't know if it was in the hotel or it was at the airport somewhere and then, and she had some kind of a story that she had told him and he he immediately bought her a brand new Cadillac and it was sent to her house you know just doing things like that all the time he'd buy and he he liked the police the, he liked the cops. And he would buy Cadillacs for for some of the police that would be um, on duty around him, those kind of things. <clears throat> so just extremely, extremely generous. And, and of course, he gave the stamps. Well, I, he bought us a brand new bus. You know, and I mean, it was that was a $150,000, $200,000 bus. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he, I don't know if you know the country singer T.G. Shepard. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, he, he bought uh, he bought T.G. Shepard a, <clears throat> a bus, you know, to help him out, give him a start. And just just amazing things like that, you know. Uh, just, a, just a good man and, a, and a, so generous. Um, you know, on the bad side was just the, the, the demons that would, that caused him to, you know, have to have medication you know to, to sleep because he slept during the daytime he, he was up at night and he was he, he uh, stayed up all night and slept during the day because I mean when you're Elvis there's not a whole lot you can do in the daytime without you know and have your privacy um, anytime there, there'd be people outside the gate at Graceland you know 24 7 24 hours a day uh, he couldn't even leave the house you know without People screaming at him and him and follow him. So he got into this thing of, of uh, sleeping all day and then doing whatever he did at night. <clears throat> but the you know he eventually had to have help in order to sleep in the daytime and then and then help to keep him awake at night. And so that that stuff got addictive and it got that that's what took him from us. You know I think. Um, <clears throat> So that was the that was the bad side. But I, you know, I did I did over two hundred shows with him, um, and I never I never saw a bad show. You know, there was there was a couple of times when he wasn't his best. You know, you could tell that he was he was not himself, um, and some of the notes and stuff. You know, that he was hitting and some of the, some of his movements you know were off and he was he was uh overweight a little bit and that kind of stuff but i mean i only i only saw that a couple of times the rest of the time you know the shows were just spot on they were just killer shows i talked with in in 95 i talked with charlie hodge 
about Elvis. And back then, I just saw the interview not so long ago. Uh, he told me that Elvis was sick and people did not know that. And that was the reason he it got worse and worse for Elvis. Did you notice that uh, that it got worse for him in the last year or the last no. years? <clears throat> no, we didn't. You know, I, I guess that the change was was kind of gradual. Well, I, actually, there would you know there'd be we'd do a we'd do an eight or ten day tour, and then we wouldn't see him again for you know a month or two, maybe a couple of months, and then we'd do another ten day tour or whatever, and so. And in between that time when we didn't see him, there was a couple of times when the first night of a tour, he'd come on stage and, you you know, we would, and those, those were the times that I mentioned, you know, a while ago that were, where he wasn't himself. And we'd see him come on stage and we could tell that he would, uh, you know, that he'd be, well, a lot of people say that he was really overweight. And I think that with his stomach and his hands, I think a lot of it was he, he was uh, was swelling. You know, it wasn't just him overeating and putting on a lot of weight. He had a uh, he had a colon problem. Uh, you know, he couldn't go to the bathroom, and I think a lot of the, you know his hands looked like he could hardly even make a fist. His his fingers and hands would be just swollen, uh, and it, then his gut would be really bloated. Uh, and I and I think that was more of him being sick than it was from overeating. Uh, but we didn't know that. We didn't know that. We didn't know it at the time. <clears throat> In 1977, the Colonel uh, made a contract making CBS TV special. Um, do you have any thoughts about the special? And were you worried before the special because of the way Elvis had it? Because Many years ago, I talked with Mina Smith uh, from the Sweet Inspiration, and she said that after the show, she said, "Oh, he, after the shows, she thought it was went good, and she got very um, shocked when she saw the special later on. It was shown after Elvis is dead, uh, how Elvis looked, because she said, you know, you didn't see that when you were with him on stage. You know, on stage, everything just looked very nice, good, and we felt we did a good job. And then afterwards, of course, then I could see that." Uh, that he was maybe not feeling that good. Yes, I, I had the same experience. I felt I felt the same way. You know, it was, it was a lot of difference um, watching that show, watching it on TV, and and what he looked like and felt like. You know, whenever we were actually there, it was a big difference. I think that was the first, probably to the, the first time, you know, for me realizing just how sick he was. And August 16, you are on the way to do a new tour, and uh, you got a call. Yes, <clears throat> we were we were at the airport here in Nashville. Uh, we were getting ready to start a start another 10 day tour. It was going to start in Portland, Maine, and the, you know they were sending the plane. They would, they would hire a plane to, to fly all the Nashville crew. Um, on the tours, and so we were waiting for the plane to, to, to get to us and, and pick us up. And we got a call from um, I don't remember who called us, it had to have been somebody from the from Graceland and just said, Hey, the, the tour is canceled. Um, you guys, everybody go home. That's all they said, they didn't say. You know, something's happened to Elvis or Elvis has died. None of that. They just said the tour is canceled and you guys can go home. So we all go, wow. So we, our speculation at that time, I thought, you know, something's happened to Vernon. You know, his, his dad must have passed away. And I get in the car you know, and I'm heading home and, then I, and I have my radio, radio on, of course, and I hear it, you know, on the radio. So that was kind of kind of strange, but I understand, I understand them, you know, kind of not telling us at that time, you know, what exactly was going on. They were scrambling themselves so much they probably didn't know what to what to say or do. But then uh, <clears throat> soon after that, they they sent for us, you know, the stamps and JD to come to Memphis, and uh, of course JD. He had a pretty big hand in in uh, arranging uh, the funeral 
and uh, of course we we sang at the funeral, which which was no fun. Obviously, we stood both stood over behind his casket in the in the living room there at, at Graceland, and uh, it was an open casket. It was, yeah. It was. Did you ever meet with the Colonel Tom Parker? Now they're making a movie about him. Did you meet with him, and what was your impression of him? You know, I was I was around him some. I was, uh, you know, I, I was never never officially introduced to him. You know, I'm just I was just one of the guys, but I was around him quite a bit, uh, especially in Vegas. You know, I would stand with him and, and watch him gamble millions of dollars. Um, uh, and I'd see him, we'd see him on the road some, but I didn't have any really a lot of interaction with him. You know, I, I was, uh, I was intimidated by him and, you know, he was, he was not a, he was not exactly a really friendly person. Was he good for Elvis in your mind or was it a bad thing for Elvis to stick with him for the last couple of years? You know, it's a shame that Elvis never went to Europe, and I think I think Colonel uh, was a big reason that that we never or he never toured Europe. I think I think uh, I think the Colonel, just my guess, but I, I think he, he 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 had left the country. He might might have had trouble getting back in. I'm not sure about that. That's just my my thoughts, but. Um, it's just a shame that that the fans in Europe, you know, didn't get to see him. But how did you get on? Did you the Stamps continued playing? Uh, did you go touring uh, shortly after and uh, went back to the tours you already had scheduled? In the yeah, we, we of course we always had uh, you know we always had gospel tours scheduled. You know they they'd be booked far in advance. And uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't many days after that that we were, you know, we were back out on the road doing our gospel thing. And uh, of course, a lot of a lot of the Elvis fans had started to join up our gospel concerts because, you know, we were we had been so close to him, and people people associated us with Elvis, so a lot of the fans would come, you know, to to see us then. So. Uh, Kept that whole thing going for a long time. <clears throat> Still playing with the Stames, you one day go to your manager's office and he has got himself a new secretary. Is that something you remember? Yeah, um, yeah. We had a, we had a manager at the time. This was in uh, 1979, um, and I went to the manager's office one day and. Uh, there's this uh, new secretary, receptionist, sitting in the front office and um, really got my attention. And um, she spoke to me and was real friendly to me and that got my attention as well. And so a couple of weeks after that, I guess it was probably a couple of weeks after meeting her, I, I about got up the nerve to to call her and uh, ask her, you know, ask her out. And <clears throat> we've, we've kind of been together ever since then. Um, and of course she had uh, a couple of daughters with, uh, you know, from a previous marriage. And those daughters turned out to be uh, Winona Judd and Ashley Judd. And the secretary was it was uh, Naomi Judd. So we've been together for we've been together for about forty years. Uh, when did you decide to leave the Stames and to start up a, a new band? You, you wanted to go into more country instead of gospel. Uh, yeah, you know we we were still doing a lot of a lot of Elvis things, you know, during that time and. Um, and it, it got to be, uh, it was way, it was way out, way out of our wheelhouse, you know, for, for us to be doing the kind of 
music that we were doing and we were so it was more about being in front of the the fans you know the elvis fans and and that kind of thing it was more about that than it was the actual music you know and so um uh, the oak ridge boys had really started to to get uh, famous with the country a country group I don't, I'm, do you know the oak ridge boys no sorry um and but there was there were several several groups um harmony groups that were starting to get popular in country music and so when i realized that that was going on you know i wanted to to try to uh, to make it in, into the in the country music world so i started a i started a country group called we actually called the group memphis um and um we, we did we worked a lot you know we traveled all over the country and up into canada and, and and worked a lot it was a great group and uh put on a great show uh but we didn't have any uh recording success you know we put some records out but it didn't do much for us but we uh, did a lot of traveling and, and uh, working with uh, with that group when did you decided that you also had time to become manager uh, next to your music Well, I, I eventually, whenever, whenever um, my wife, you know, became very successful, uh, that that changed, that changed the, you know, the our, our relationship some, you know, with the both of us traveling and going all the time, and and so she was obviously having a lot more success doing what she was doing than I was, so I I agreed to give up. Uh, give up my I actually gave up the group and gave up singing all together for a long time and worked you know worked for her and uh, you know in a management capacity uh, so I did that several years well, was it a time where you were tired of music you said do you ever get tired of listening to music or performing music uh, you know I, I was tired of I was tired of the road tired of traveling I wasn't tired of the music you know I love I love to sing and and I still sing I still sing around the house all the time I was, I was singing in the shower this morning you know I love I love singing um but the road you know the traveling is, is what is really what kills you out there especially the country groups you know you you really got to be successful in a big way to be able to fly and you know have a, have your own plane and fly to your gigs and you know most most country acts travel by they have their own tour buses um but even with that i mean that's when you're when you're out there for 30 days and, and you're traveling on a tour bus it can really beat you up and uh it, it's a it's a hard way to live so it was good for you also to just make a stop and see other sides of life Is yeah that the way <clears throat> Yeah, it was more important then for it was more important for us to be together, um, you know, than for me to be out trying to trying to make a another quartet successful. I needed to, I needed to be home and make the, make the home successful. And uh, you have sang on some of the recordings with the Jots. And I know you have also been singing at uh, a band that I know very well, or two brothers I know very well, the Bellamy brothers. You have been singing on one of their records too. It, yeah, it was just some some bit parts on uh, you know on a couple of songs. You know, I didn't I didn't really record albums with them. It's just that it would bring me in to do you know a bass line here and there and that kind of thing. And then you were traveling with your wife. But what did you do else? Do you, you manage them, of course? And did you get some spare time to have some hobbies? I know you love playing golf and. Uh, And uh, you also played a little bit poker. Uh, was that your hobbies? Uh, well, yeah, golf. Golf is kind of my, my thing these days. Um, I really enjoy being out and on, out on the courses, and um, it's just a good, calm game for somebody my age. If you look back at your life, is there something you are especially proud of uh, having done in your life? Well, you know, of course, my the the highlight of my of my life was was being on stage, you know, with Elvis and experiencing that that level of of 
music, you know, uh, that uh, it was just, uh, you know, just incomparable. There's nothing else to compare to it. And uh, so, I'm, so I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the records that, I'm, that I did with him. And I got to do, uh, you know, when they did the remake on, um, on the gospel thing, um, they, they remade uh, just a couple of years ago. They did redid Where No One Stands Alone record. I don't know if you have that. Yeah, I have it, yeah. And Lisa Marie uh, is on that. Well, we got to go in and, and uh, me and, and the Stamps and, and the uh, Imperials, all of us were in the studio together to redo the um, redo the background vocals on that record. Um, so that was uh, that, that's a recording that I'm that I'm proud to be part of. And another record you can be proud of is Legacy, and people can go to your homepage and buy it. Is that true? Also with an autograph. Yeah, uh, it's, it's Larry Strickland, uh, Larry Strickland Music dot com. And and you can buy it as with a signature on. Also, I could see that with your autograph. Yeah, you can you can download it, or you can or you can order order the CD itself if you want. You know, if you want it autographed and that kind of stuff, you'll have to order it, but. If you don't, if you don't care about an autograph, you can just download the, the music. Um, and also on, the, on my website, there's a lot of photos of me with Elvis and and me and my wife Naomi and and the girls. And there's uh, um, there's a little clip on uh, that I put on there where Elvis is introducing me on stage. Um, uh, you know, so it's, it's a pretty interesting website to, to look at. Thank you very much for giving time for this interview with me and this talk with me. Yes, thank you, Steg, for having me. I enjoyed it. And I hope you get time to make another recording we can listen to also. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, I'm gathering songs now, getting ready to, to go back in and, and record some more. That sounds very good. Thank you. And that was all we had in this program uh, today. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll be watching it again when we return soon in the future. Welcome to my world Won't you come on in